Welcome to our webinar. We are very pleased that you could be with us this afternoon on the topic of adult ADHD, uh, impact on chronic conditions and adherence to medical rep recommendations. I'm Dr. Mary Salanto. I'm very pleased to be your host today. Um, I'll share just a bit of background about the genesis of this webinar. We on the Public Policy Committee of CHAD, Children and Adults with ADHD, we're very impressed by the recent results of a research by Dr. Russell Barkley that indicate that adults with ADHD are at greater risk for disorders and conditions that affect physical health, and that to together take a toll on, um, on expected uh, estimated life expectancy. So following his lead, we wanted to help get the word out to healthcare providers that Identifying and treating ADHD is a matter of public health as well as mental health. So in this effort, we are enormously pleased to have been able to bring together Dr. Barkley today, as well as experts in different domains of physical health as each relates to adults with ADHD. So Dr. Barkley will lead off by presenting the background and implications of his groundbreaking research. Dr. Roberto Olivario will talk about obesity. Dr. Scott Collins will talk about smoking and ADHD, and Dr. Brooke Molina on uh, drug abuse uh, in ADHD. And then Dr. Larry Culpepper will discuss how primary care practitioners can identify and manage ADHD in their adult patients. Thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate it. And I'm also grateful to Chad for inviting me to be a part of this, I think, very important presentation on the uh, health risks and chronic medical conditions that may be associated with ADHD and their implications for diagnosis and management. Uh, to begin with, very quickly, this is my disclosure slide for my sources of support for the previous 12 months, uh, but I don't want to spend much time on it, of course, because my time is very short. Um, and as Mary said, I'm with the uh, VCU Medical Center in the Department of Psychiatry and the Virginia Treatment Center as well. And my presentation is going to be an overview of health outcomes uh, with some comments on, as Mary pointed out, the impact of ADHD on life expectancy. Now, to begin with, to understand why ADHD might impact the health outcomes of children and adults with the disorder, it helps to understand the nature of the disorder, which is that ADHD is far more than a disorder of attention, much less a problem with hyperactivity or impulsivity. Uh, it is, in fact, viewed these days and has been since the 1980s as a disorder of self-regulation. And that means, therefore, that it is associated with a variety of deficits uh, in the neuropsychological executive functions, which allow humans to self-regulate their own behavior, of which there are at least seven major ones that are recognized uh, by the field of neuropsychology and neuroscience more generally. Such self-regulation permits the individual to anticipate future hypothetical events that might be associated with current situations and behavior, and then to organize their behavior over time in order to maximize their long-term outcome. So as Fuster said, the frontal lobes have a single overarching purpose if we can reduce it to one, and that is the cross-temporal organization of behavior to maximize future outcomes over immediate gratification. Uh, and since ADHD clearly interferes with this capacity for anticipating future events and then organizing behavior to maximize the delayed over the immediate event, it begins to make sense why ADHD would be associated uh, with difficulties in, um, in health uh, as well as impairment. Uh, if you look at ADHD as a disorder of self-regulation, uh, then you will see that it is associated with a number of traits that we know predict health outcomes. Two of these, of course, are delay of gratification. Uh, and the second one is the personality trait of conscientiousness, which is the ability to contemplate the outcomes of one actions for oneself and others before making the decision to act. ADHD is highly negatively correlated with that trait. 
Uh, and as we know from numerous studies in health psychology, conscientiousness is the single best predictor of death by all causes in humans from childhood onward. There is no better predictor than that personality trait, accounting for upwards of 30 to 40 percent of the variation in human lifespan and death by all causes. So understanding that ADHD is negatively associated with the capacity for delay of gratification, along with the personality trait of low conscientiousness, then we can see that hundreds of times a day, people with ADHD have to invoke self-regulation in order to make optimal choices that they face in conflict situations between immediate gratification and the delayed outcomes that may be associated with those choices. And obviously ADHD biases the decision-making of these individuals toward very impulsive choices throughout these daily scenarios. And therefore, the individual is optimizing momentary consequences over the more important uh, delayed consequences. And if you do that hundreds of times a day with impulsive decision-making, that is going to have a cumulative impact on the risks that you have for impairment in a variety of major life activities, but especially including health and quality of life. In addition, impulsive choices can on occasion singularly impact the individual's immediate risks for injury and death. And we will show that ADHD does that as well. So it is no surprise that ADHD is linked to a variety of adverse outcomes in virtually every major domain of major life activities in which humans engage. But specifically, we are going to focus on health and health maintenance. Now, for more than 40 years, we have known since the work of Denny Cantwell and James Stewart that ADHD is associated with a heightened risk for accidental and other injuries across childhood, and more recently evidence shows that this continues into adulthood, including not only a risk for traumatic brain injuries, but risk for accidental injuries of all types, including burns, lacerations, as well as uh, poisonings, and so on. Uh, as a consequence of this, we will see that ADHD increases markedly the risk of dying by age 10, and if you survive to that age, of death by age 45 or so. There is also, as you know, an increased likelihood of criminal behavior as well as reactive aggression toward others, as well as bullying and uh, victimization by others as well, all of which has implications for the physical health of the individual and their risk for injury. We know from large-scale studies in the United Kingdom that now have been replicated here in the U.S. that ADHD is linked to also an increased risk for intimate partner violence in cohabiting intimate relationships. Uh, that coupled along with alcohol abuse, drug use, uh, and even antisocial behavior further heightens the risk. But ADHD alone is a risk for violence in relationships, particularly for reactive aggression. Uh, and we have known for decades now, going back at least 30 years or more, that there is a heightened risk for suicide attempts among individuals with ADHD. We know that depression coupled with ADHD heightens the risk for suicidal ideation, but it is the impulsivity linked to ADHD that you can see here increases the risk for a suicide attempt by four to five times over that seen in typical individuals or even among depressed individuals. So again, depression increases for thinking about suicide, but it is ADHD's impulsivity that increases that risk of a suicide attempt, often quite impulsively, leading to a much more serious attempt, a much greater likelihood of success in the attempt, and if it is not successful, a greater likelihood of hospitalization as a consequence of the seriousness of the injuries. Now, besides that, my work and that of uh, Brooke Molina uh, and earlier uh, other researchers have shown that, such as Kate Flory, for instance, that ADHD increases risky sexual behavior, not only among adolescents, but also we have now documented among clinic referred adults as well. Uh, and that includes not only the risk of earlier start, starting sexual activity, but a uh, 10 times greater increase in risk for teenage pregnancy, uh, and four times greater risk for sexually transmitted disease. Uh, and then of course, because of the lack of use of contraception, or at least the reduced likelihood of that, 
along with the greater likelihood of having more sex partners in their lifetime, those two alone would increase the likelihood that there would be uh, HPV infection. And that, of course, as you know, not only increases the risk for cervical cancer, but also for oral and anal cancers as well in mid to late life. Now, going back more than 40 to 50 years, we know that ADHD has been repeatedly linked to poor physical health, that is, reports about general health upon reaching adulthood. And more recently, thanks to the meta-analysis of Samuel Cortese and others, we know that ADHD is linked to disrupted sleep, inefficient sleep, and daytime sleepiness as well, and this applies to children and adults with ADHD. More recently, there has been increased interest in showing that ADHD in women is associated with a heightened risk for diagnosis of fibromyalgia syndrome. And this is seen both in women with fibromyalgia having a heightened risk of ADHD and the inverse as well. That's also interesting because we've seen recently in the DeMonta study that there is shared genetic liability between ADHD and a variety of medical conditions, including gout, migraine, headache, and risk for type 2 diabetes, among others. Uh, and as you see here, more recently, uh, studies have shown that there's a greater risk for gastrointestinal difficulties as well within this population. Uh, Brooke is going to talk about this as well as Dr. Collins uh, later in the program, so I won't dwell on it, but clearly ADHD has been for a long time uh, known to be associated with an increased risk of substance abuse, a substance dependence, and even increased frequency of use uh, starting at adolescence, but especially accelerating as we enter adulthood. Later, you're also going to hear evidence presented on the greater risk of ADHD for obesity. But in addition to obesity, it is associated with a variety of impulsive eating patterns, eating pathology, particularly associated with binge eating, uh, with a preference for high carbohydrate, high sugar containing, sort of fast food, Western style diets. Uh, this increases the risk for dental infections and dental caries, that on top of dental trauma that has been shown to be linked to that increased risk for accidental injury means that there are going to be problems with dental care among these individuals as well. And no surprise then if you eat a high sugar diet with high carbs uh, and binge eating, you're going to develop not only obesity, which we'll hear about later, but also downstream a growing risk for type 2 diabetes. Uh, and as you see here, women with ADHD by late adolescence uh, have an increased risk for a diagnosis of impulse eating disorders, particularly bulimia. Uh, there is no, uh, I think, doubt then that as we look at this pattern of health making decisions in these individuals, that over time we should expect to see a growing risk for coronary heart disease. And the Milwaukee study, my own study, was among the first to show that this was the case that has now been replicated by several other studies, show a heightened risk for hypertension, uh, in, impaired ratios in uh, HDL to total cholesterol, a heightened risk for atherosclerotic plaque in coronary arteries over the next five to 10 years using the Framingham heart data to predict outcome and so on. So we should expect by midlife to start to see uh, a growing risk for CHD problems in this population. And then most recently, late life, we see a, risk, a growing risk for dementia, as well as Parkinson's disease and disorders of the basal ganglia and cerebellum more generally. What is interesting is that the DeMontis genome-wide study shows that some of these risks uh, are as a result of shared genetics between ADHD and the genetics that contribute to risk for many of these other disorders. Going further now, we have direct evidence over the past decade uh, that ADHD uh, doubles to quadruples the risk for early mortality, beginning with Klein study, which is the longest running longitudinal study of ADHD children into midlife, showing a more than doubling of mortality by age 41. Uh, followed later by the study out of Syracuse showing that adults with ADHD are twice as likely to die within any four-year period, uh, principally as a result of accidental injury, but secondarily suicide. And then we also have the Dalsgaard study out of Denmark, coupled with Vertanen study out of Sweden, uh, and then the study by Chen in Taiwan, all large population studies showing that ADHD uh, is twice as likely to result in death by age 10 and is more than four and a half times as likely 
to result in death by midlife, again, from accidental injury. Secondary to that would be suicide. And most recently in the Taiwanese study, also a growing risk for death by homicide. Uh, we also have uh, recently a reanalysis of the Swedish data by Sun showing again these risks, but in a much more detailed fashion. Interestingly, the genome-wide study by DeMontis also showed that there is shared genetic risk for early mortality, even in the parents of ADHD children, not just in the children as well. And we know that, of course, the parents carry a much higher risk of having the same disorder as their children. So it makes sense that they too may suffer from earlier mortality. As Mary pointed out, we looked at all of this evidence and we began to wonder, well, what about life expectancy? If you make it to midlife, is ADHD going to have some adverse effect on total life expectancy? Uh, and as a result of my Milwaukee longitudinal study and having lots of data on the physical uh, outcomes of these children and their health, we were able to use some of the algorithms at the University of Connecticut their Center for uh, Life Expectancy Studies, the Goldenson Research Center, uh, and we imputed all of our data into their formula, and we showed this, that if you are diagnosed in childhood, regardless of whether you recover from disorder or not, you are going to have about a nine-year reduction in healthy life uh, and about an eight to nine-year reduction in total life expectancy, as you see in this graph. This is healthy life years here, this is unhealthy life years, which is increasing. This is total uh, life expectancy. And that is just from knowing that you were diagnosed in childhood. But if we look at the persistence of the disorder to age 27, we see that those whose disorder persisted have an approximately 12 and a half year reduction in their healthy life expectancy and overall about an 11 to 12 year reduction in their total life expectancy if their disorder persists. Even if it doesn't persist, there's about a seven-year reduction in life expectancy over what we see in the control group followed over the same period of time. So why did this happen? Because when we look at our data set, we found that of the 14 variables we were using to predict life expectancy, ADHD was associated with marked adversity in at least eight or nine of these, as you see here, and as other presenters will talk about to some extent on those variables as well. So we have all of these variables that are reducing the lifespan of these individuals. But we went further to look at background factors, and we did have a proxy for personality trait of conscientiousness. And that was the emotional impulsivity and poor self-regulation scale of my executive function rating scale. And what we found is that behavioral inhibition, which is a proxy for conscientiousness, explained all of these first order risk variables. Indeed, we accounted for nearly 31% of the variation in life expectancy within this data set. So what that means then is that clinicians should not only be concentrating on the first order risks, but should also be assessing the background factors that have to do with ADHD, with impulsivity, and with poor self-regulation. So I hope you've seen in this presentation that besides a disorder of attention, we have a serious disorder of self-regulation that produces numerous adverse consequences in major life activities, including a uh, adverse effect on health and lifestyle and resulting in a market reduction in life expectancy well beyond that seen with the major risk factors that we are focusing on now in society such as obesity, smoking, sleep, exercise, and so on. ADHD is worse than all of them combined in its reduction of life expectancy. And I'll leave it to my other presenters to discuss the implications uh, of these findings for uh, the uh, healthcare providers who may be listening in. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Russ. That was really a terrific overview and introduction. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna be talking about obesity. And when we think of ADHD, 
really it's the everyday life things that get affected. Every ADHD affects every life domain and what is more basic than eating. Um, and as doc, Dr. Barkley had presented in, in his talk that we know that people with ADHD carry a higher risk of obesity. Now studies will show even, and this starts very young, that in studies that look at young individuals in a, a lab experiment where variables are controlled, they looked at mood, they looked at their liking of food, they found that the uh, children between the ages of 10 and 14 who had ADHD ate more. However, what was striking is that it wasn't influenced by their mood state or their level of hunger or even their liking of food. It was simply that it was just there. Other studies have shown that people with ADHD have more disruptive eating habits, they tended to eat a less nutritious diet, and we're very drawn to diets with higher sugar intakes, especially in beverages. Studies in bad bariatric patients have found a high prevalence of people with ADD, uh, ADHD in those samples. Um, and this particular study found that almost a third of people who presented for bariatric surgery had ADHD. But interestingly, when the body mass index was looked at, even for people over, four, uh, over a BMI of over 40, it was 43% of that sample had ADHD. So not only that, but even in mean weight loss, post-surgery, they found that those individuals who had ADHD lost less weight uh, post-surgery uh, than their control subjects. Um, what's interesting also is that the patients with ADHD also had more treatment visits and needed longer duration. Uh, studies find even with children who presented in clinics for obesity um, often will have a high prevalence of ADHD. In this particular is a small sample, but studies looking at children who did not meet criteria for any other DSM-4 disorder found that 58% of them were found to have ADHD, which is significantly higher than what we see in the general population. Um, of those children with ADHD, only 40% were diagnosed before the study. Um, signifying how underdiagnosed actually ADHD is. It's sort of this myth that it's overdiagnosed. In fact, um, I find clinically it's more underdiagnosed. Uh, similarly, uh, Fleming found in a sample of severely obese women uh, with a BMI over 35 that almost a third of them had ADHD. Now, one might wonder whether being hyperactive, being impulsive, does that actually protect children from obesity if they're bouncing off the walls and running around? Uh, well, actually, a study found that the opposite uh, was the case, that in fact, the BMI scores for this sample of almost 100 ADHD male patients was significantly higher than the reference population. Um, and again, when that BMI was over the 90th percentile, we found that ADHD was even more common. Uh, similarly, in a study of Dutch children found that uh, between boys between 10 and 17, girls who were between 10 and 12 in this sample, that having ADHD carried with it four times the risk of being overweight. Now, it's not just with eating. Uh, studies have also shown when following children over the years that not only does ADHD significantly predict obesity, but it also predicted less physical activity. Uh, so in this sample, when they looked at children between seven and eight and followed them until the age of 16, they found, um, you know, more obesity, but also less physical activity. And in this particular study found a lack of physical activity, having a stronger association with obesity than overeating. And so I clinically, I would say I see both of those. Um, similarly, Cortez, he found uh, men and women with ADHD having a higher body mass index, more likely to be obese. And this is also after controlling for socioeconomic factors and lifetime mental disorders. So ADHD alone, would be predicting that. Now, why is that? Uh, when we understand and help our patients understand why having ADHD can lead to that, it adds to a lot of validation and a lot of much more motivation to start to seek help uh, for uh, these issues and particularly in achieving a more healthy diet. Uh, there are biological reasons helping people understand that you know, an ADHD brain is a brain that really is deficient in having certain neurochemicals and neurotransmitters, including dopamine, which is sort of the neurotransmitter of reward and stimulation. 
And uh, the ADHD brain is known as having sort of a reward deficiency syndrome. And, you know, as I tell my patients, kale isn't going to produce that reward in the brain, unfortunately. Um, and so people with ADHD are drawn towards more high sugar, simple carbs that are going to produce that sort of dopamine hit, so to speak, in the brain. So you have a brain that is by baseline bored and understimulated and food and particularly the, the less nutritious food provides that sort of level of reward. In addition, a neurochemical known as GABA, which is responsible for inhibition, the ADHD brain is known to have less GABA. So now you have an uninhibited, bored, understimulated brain. And so it's understandable why food becomes something that becomes very, very appealing. Now, clinically, with a lot of the patients I work with, I specialize not only in ADHD patients, but I specialize in working with men with eating disorders, like bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. And from my patients, we'll often hear um, that after some other high dopamine-related activity, like sex or a real fun event, that a lot of times eating and binge eating could be a way of almost keeping that dopamine high going, for lack of a better word. And so a lot of times uh, with patients, they, they find themselves sort of eating um, even after, that it doesn't always have to be this um, sort of negative trigger. Um, in addition, what we know from dopamine receptors, um, that they overlap with both obesity and binge eating um, in research that is done today. Cognitively, people with ADHD lack interoceptive awareness, which is basically the mindfulness of what's happening inside the body. Am I hungry? Am I satisfied? Am I thirsty? All of that requires a tuning in where many people with ADHD are out. They're sort of more externally oriented and focused. So to be a healthy eater, you have to have a high degree of interoceptive awareness. Executive functioning deficits, as Dr. Barkley had mentioned, I mean, to eat healthy, you have to have a certain level of executive functioning skills to plan meals, to determine, to manage, uh, time manage, to have four different pots going. All of that requires a level of executive planning, which can be very difficult for people with ADHD. Decision making can be very difficult, which can lead a lot of people with ADHD to be impulsive about their food decisions. Um, I had a patient many years ago said that he procrastinates, um, which people with ADHD are prone to procrastination. And a lot of times food can become the behavior to sort of procrastinate with. For some people, it could be playing video games or watching television. But again, you have food, which is always accessible, it's legal. Um, and so it becomes the easy go-to for people who are quite impulsive. People with ADHD are also cognitively overwhelmed by all of the information that a lot of us can be frankly overwhelmed with in terms of what's good to eat, what's not, are eggs good or eggs bad? And sometimes it makes it very difficult for them to sift through that. In addition, people with ADHD will sometimes eat as a way of gaining executive fuel if they feel really fatigued or not motivated, that they feel that eating uh, certain food or overeating might actually create that energy, which it doesn't really do. It doesn't serve that purpose. People with ADHD are impulsive, and we refer to that as the, the seafood diet, that if they see it, they eat it, um, and simply because it's there, and can become very poor at self-regulation. Uh, when I have patients monitor how many calories they're eating, they vastly underestimate the amount of calories that, that they eat. Because again, you have to have a certain level of mindfulness and presence to even be able to know what am I eating, how much am I eating, how often am I eating. People with ADHD, as Dr. Barkley mentioned, um, very prone to sleep problems, sleep disorders like sleep apnea, and not sleep apnea just because they're overweight. Um, they're prone to sleep apnea even independent of their weight. And if you have sleep apnea, that could then predispose you to becoming obese and dysregulate your appetite, your metabolism. Uh, people with ADHD can get hyper-focused and sometimes work through or be into something to the degree where they might skip meals, but then once they're done with that activity, they're super hungry and ravenous, and again, are often going to be drawn towards high-carb, high-fat, high-sugar foods. Um, so they hit this sort of wall of hunger. Um, the eating habits of people with ADHD tends to be quite dysregulated. They tend to be doing something else. I've had patients 
they eat their breakfast while driving to work, which is obviously not safe. Um, they are watching television while eating. They are here, there, and everywhere. And not sometimes I have I have to work with patients that just sitting down at a dinner table versus standing up and moving around while eating this and that, which leads to less mindfulness in terms of what they're eating. We've all heard of eating a pint of Ben and Jerry's when we have a stressful day. Um, but for people with ADHD, certainly emotional triggers like the stress that comes with poor executive function, sadness, anger, poor self-esteem, the, the emotion or lack of emotion, I guess, I hear most from my patients with ADHD and who have issues with overeating is boredom, that they, they are looking for something to stimulate them. Um, one of my patients said, it's either going to be a cigarette I'm going to smoke, I'm going to bite my nails, or I'm going to eat. Um, it could be a way of coping with un, with underlying depression and anxiety, of which 20% of people with ADHD have depression, struggle, have a depressive episode. 30% will have some anxiety at some point in their life. Food is very rewarding. It's very sensory. And for people particularly with those hyperactive thoughts, that food can be a way of kind of grounding them because it's very sensory uh, driven. Now, in terms of healthy weight loss, it can be very difficult because people with ADHD are drawn towards instant gratification, outcome driven. They can be quite impulsive and very impatient um, with healthy weight loss, which for a male could be up to two pounds a week and for a female, one to one and a half pounds a week. That's very hard for people with ADHD to hear. So for any and all of us who are working with patients, it's so important, especially for physicians who see these patients, to encourage them to seek ADHD treatment. If they have ADHD and, and are struggling with their weight, uh, not treating the ADHD is undermining treatment of absolutely everything else that they're working on. And then in addition, see, encouraging them to seek uh, support and therapy. And the work that I do with patients is mindfulness strategies around eating, around shopping, around preparing food, um, in terms of being more mindful of the body and those internal cues. Cognitive behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, nutritional support can be really helpful as an accountability, executive functioning training, and really needing a lot of support around that structure and that accountability around healthy weight loss. Also in terms of parents, you know, one of the things coming from the eating disorder community, it's often seen as very taboo to sort of manage your child's eating and you don't want to be too on top of your, your kid because you don't want to inspire an eating disorder in them. However, I have to say it's very important. There's a fine line between, um, you know, sort of being over um, compensating for sort of issues that maybe a parent has around body image and so forth. But kids with ADHD do need a lot of work and support and accountability around their eating. Um, and so it is very important to structure meals, sometimes in terms of what you bring, you know, in the house, talking to your children about healthy eating and starting to model that. Um, and as any of us who are in the mental health, who are in the medical profession, it's so important in relaying this information with a sense of compassionate validation um, to understand that these patients really are doing the best they can do with the information they have. Once they understand ADHD, because again, keep in mind, most people are underdiagnosed, especially if you're over the age of 30, where, you know, when many, many years ago, what we knew about ADHD is a fraction of what we know now in terms of identification is letting them know a little information goes a long way. And once they get that treatment and understand that although they're wired in ways to be more impulsive and to be more sensory seeking, um, that you know that doesn't mean that they lack willpower or that they can't work on this. It just takes you know looking at it through that ADHD lens to help them understand the strategies and the treatment that they need in order to help with that. Because there's a lot of shame wrapped up for a lot of people who are in larger bodies, as we know, and a lot of discrimination. And it's very important that we sort of take that shame away and not have people internalize the sense that they're powerless or weak, that once they have the understanding of ADHD and its influence on their eating habits, that they can, that you can see really dramatic effects. And medication can be very helpful for that. 
In fact, the first FDA approved medication for binge eating disorder is Vyvanse, which is an ADHD medication, um, which was not surprising. So studies show that when ADHD is treated psychopharmacologically, that it can help tremendously in executive function across the board, especially when it comes to eating. Uh, but there are obstacles that physicians and clinicians come about in terms of helping patients remembering to take, refill, follow up. Pa patients with ADHD are less likely to get a physical exam. They often come to the doctor when things are really bad. They can be late for appointments. They might be less likely to comply with post-surgery recommendations. So having that accountability and helping patients seek that support will be really important. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about ADHD and smoking today um, and cover both some, some broad overview as well as a lot of work from my lab over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so these are my disclosures. None of these are really uh, relevant for the topic that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so uh, three areas that I want to cover today. First of all, I want to talk about just in general, what is the relationship between ADHD and cigarette smoking? What do we know? Um, the second thing is to talk about the kind of the why. And why is it that people with ADHD um, uh, smoke more, have more difficulty quitting, et cetera? And we're going to look at this from a number of different angles. And then finally, uh, I want to think about clinical considerations uh, to take into account when we're when we're working with patients that smoke. Um, so this is a this is a really complex relationship. This is a a model that we put together a while back now, but it shows all of the different ways where features of ADHD, whether it's the genetic underpinnings the neuropharmacological basis of ADHD, some of the behavioral things, how they can intersect in different ways with different parts of the, of the sort of smoking phenomenon from being at risk for initial use all the way up to being at risk for relapsing once you become a smoker and quit. So we developed this model so that we could really hone in on individual parts of it to start breaking down this relationship empirically. Um, but to begin with, let's think about just in general what we know. So we've known for a long time, uh, like other uh, substances, that uh, cigarette smoking and nicotine use are, are, are more prevalent in individuals with ADHD. So these are data from a couple of different studies showing that in both adults and adolescent samples that uh, the rates of cigarette smoking are significantly higher in ADHD versus non-ADHD folks, uh, nearly double in, than the general population. And then also that this risk is independent of conduct disorder, which is really important because for a long time people thought, oh, it's just because ADHD uh, folks have, have conduct disorder and that's what's really driving the relationship. That's not the case. So my, my first foray into looking at the relationship between ADHD and smoking was to look at the, the association, not of a clinical diagnosis, but of the symptoms of ADHD and how those were related, related to regular smoking. And this is a paper we published back in, in 05 looking at in a population-based sample of about 15,000 people, uh, young adults, uh, what we found was a very orderly relationship, as you can see from the figure, between self-reported symptoms of ADHD uh, and risk for uh, being an ever-regular smoker. So this, this told us that this risk that we see in clinical populations is most likely driven by the fact that, by definition, people with ADHD have high levels of ADHD symptoms. And we, we and others have gone on to show that uh, these symptoms, as well as an ADHD clinical diagnosis, are associated with other features of that model that I talked about. So people with ADHD are more likely to start cigarette smoking earlier. They progress faster from initial use to regular use. Um, they have higher levels of uh, smoking and nicotine dependence, even among regular smokers. And finally, they, it's harder for them to quit. So there's a greater likelihood of failed quit attempts and poor cessation outcomes. So to, to highlight a couple of these, I want to call attention to um, some work that's come out of the MTA study. You may hear a little bit more about this from, uh, from Dr. Molina later on, because this has been a seminal study to understand a range of, of um, uh, phenomena in ADHD populations. But this is a longitudinal study. It started as a comparative treatment study when kids were between the ages of seven and nine, and then they've been followed now. Um, and for the data I'll show you, this is 16 years later. About two years after the kids were enrolled in the treatment study, uh, a, a sample a local normative control group was, was recruited uh, from, the, from the individuals who were in the study from their local schools so that it would be matched for at least geographic area and for the most part age and gender. So this is a good, good way that we can look at, at smoking behavior over time. 
Um, and at the 16-year follow-up, and this was a paper that was published by my colleague uh, at Duke, John Mitchell, um, what we saw was that uh, what, I, what I already mentioned was true in this, this well-characterized longitudinal sample. Smokers in the MTA group compared to their local comparison peers uh, were significantly more likely to be daily smokers in the past year, as well as to have more than uh, one quit attempt, uh, try to quit more. This shows the smoking onset. So you can see the blue bar uh, you know, starts to creep up, meaning the cumulative percent uh, or the cumulative uh, risk of being a smoker was greater for the ADHD kids earlier. And then really importantly on the right here, this replicates this phenomenon that I showed you in that big population-based study, even within a sample of kids that, that met a clinical threshold. So even among individuals with ADHD, symptom severity seems to be related to the probability of daily smoking. Um, so this just highlights again sort of the, the, the detailed relationship between ADHD and, um, and smoking. So I want to shift attention now and talk a little bit about some of the, 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 the why, the mechanisms that underlie uh, a lot of these different features of, of individuals with ADHD and cigarette smoking. I want to start with st trying to ask the question of why is it that smokers have a harder time quitting than, than people who are not ADHD? Um, well, we know that affect and cognition are significantly affected when people try to quit, and um, they also predict longer-term cessation outcomes. We know that affect regulation and cognition are also disrupted in ADHD in general. So these two things combined suggest that maybe this is some sort of perfect storm where we're exacerbating features that are already disrupted in ADHD, and that, that leads to a harder time quitting. So we set about to try to understand this phenomenon experimentally. Um, and we did this study. This is kind of the general design, and I'll show you a couple studies with this general design, where we bring in ADHD and non-ADHD smokers. We characterize them at baseline, and then we bring them in for a couple of different sessions. One where they've been uh, abstinent overnight, and one where they're smoking as usual. And we want to look to see sort of how they respond to various laboratory tasks and try, try to measure their, their response to these manipulations. So in this particular study, we had roughly equal numbers of uh, uh, smokers with and without ADHD that were pretty well matched across a number of features, including their, their nicotine severity or their smoking, um, uh, uh, yeah, their, their severity of um, uh, addiction. And what we found here was that uh, consistent with our hypothesis, we saw these significant interactions such that the ADHD group in general, so there's a main effect that for things like CPT commission errors, which is a measure of impulsivity, response style, which is a measure of attention allocation, they were different, but they were significantly more different when they were abstinent. So these, um, and, and there weren't, uh, yeah, given that there weren't any baseline group differences, this suggests that um, what we thought, which was that these particular processes being disrupted might be playing a role in people um, having a harder time quitting. So we followed this up, actually, uh, John again uh, did this a very similar study, very similar design, but instead of looking at um, cognitive performance, he was looking at emotion regulation and similarly found um, a, very, a very similar finding here in that the ADHD smokers had uh, lower, uh, well, in this particular case, lower uh, values on this, which is how long they would persist on a hard, difficult task. Um, it was lower overall for the ADHD folks, and when they were abstinent, it was even more that that effect and that difference was even more pronounced. So cognition and affect seem to be definitely more disrupted during smoking abstinence in ADHD smokers versus non-ADHD smokers. So another question that we've tried to tackle here is uh, to address this this idea that that individuals with ADHD are smoking to reduce the requisite symptoms, the so-called self-medication hypothesis. And the idea here is that you know, nicotine, we know neuropharmacologically works in many ways similarly to some of the medications that we, that we have for ADHD. So could it be that people are smoking in order to reduce their symptoms and, and impairments associated with the disorder? And there's a lot of different ways that we could address this. But um, for this particular study, we did, again, a pretty similar uh, design that I showed you before. We wanted to compare smokers um, uh, with and without ADHD, and we wanted to look to see would they work for cigarette puffs when they were abstinent or when they were satiated? Um, and, and we wanted to actually measure reinforcement of, of smoking under those conditions. Again, the, the groups were well matched uh, across most of the features except for their, uh, their ADHD symptoms as we would expect. And what we found was, was again, this main effect that in general, 
uh, ADHD smokers, and we literally had them in a, in a room where they were working for controlled puffs on a device that we had put together, and they had to press a button, and every, every time they got a puff, they had to press more to get the next puff, and then more to get the next puff. And this is a it's kind of a traditional operant way of measuring drug reinforcement. And we showed that this, uh, this you know, people with ADHD work more for cigarette puffs, and that difference tends to be more pronounced when they're abstinent compared to when they're satiated. Now, all of the work that I just showed you, as well as a number of our other studies, have been working in individuals who are already um, cigarette smokers. And we wanted to tackle this really, really tricky question of what is it at the very beginning of this process? What is it that leads to that risk for when people take a puff of a cigarette for the first time? Now, we obviously can't go and experimentally manipulate um, cigarette smoking, but we teamed up with a colleague at the University of Pittsburgh uh, named Ken Perkins, who had developed a paradigm to study this initial reactions to smoking. And what, what he had done was to um, use nicotine nasal spray. So we designed a study to take that uh, approach. We got young adult, uh, young adult non-smokers um, with and without ADHD. So they, we verified they'd never been a smoker. We brought them into the lab on three different occasions, and we gave them three different doses of nicotine nasal spray blinded. So they either got placebo, they got a low dose, or they got a high dose. Then they also came in and they actually worked, to, or, or they made choices for uh, different doses. And what we found, uh, this is again showing that the, the groups were um, pretty comparable. Um, what we found, and it's not as clear here, but this is the, from the publication, is that there were significant differences across the groups uh, in that the ADHD individuals reported significantly higher pleasant reactions uh, and more dizziness. And there was actually an interaction for this dizziness um, uh, initial reaction, which tends to be the most robust predictor of subsequent um, uh, addiction. Uh, and there were no differences between the groups in terms of their unpleasant reactions. Moreover, what we saw was that there was a main effect in that the individuals with ADHD tended to choose nicotine more often than the um, than placebo um, compared to the non-ADHD group. So what this what this showed us is that even when they're exposed, even without a history of consistent nicotine use, that first exposure, there's probably something qualitatively different about um, getting that first exposure to a cigarette in individuals with ADHD who, and, and those who don't have ADHD, which I think has profound implications for how we think about educating our, our younger patients and talking to them about the risks of, of smoking. So lastly, um, I wanna shift gears a little bit to talk about some clinical considerations. And in particular, one, um, one thing that I wanna target is that um, there's been some um, controversy in the literature that, uh, that uh, stimulant medication in particular may be a risk factor for increasing the rates of substance use, including cigarette smoking. Um, and there have been, there have been a few studies published that got a lot of attention and, and uh, skeptics of the use of stimulant medication really picked up on these to say these are data that show uh, that stimulants are actually increasing uh, cigarette smoking. Um, and there are a lot of methodological limitations of these. And so we, we've done a number of studies to try to kind of understand this a little bit better. One of the studies that we did is, is on the left here is very comparable to a, a similar study done on the right. The difference being that the, the medication in these two studies was Vyvanse versus Concerta. Basically, this was, these were clinical trials of adult smokers with ADHD. And the goal was to see whether or not uh, medication could facilitate a smoking cessation attempt. So what you what you see is two different groups in each of these figures. And uh, on the top panels for both the figures, what you're looking at is the, um, the self-reported number of cigarettes per day um, up to a particular uh, a scheduled quit date, which is you know, somewhere between baseline and visit one on the left. And then there's the actual dotted line on the right. But what you see here is that there was no difference between drug and placebo on self-reported cigarettes per day and people who wanted to try to quit smoking. Um, moreover, if you look at the bottom panels, what you see is that the medication, when you look at uh, ADHD rating scale scores, it worked. So it actually reduced symptoms of ADHD, didn't have any adverse effects on, on making it more difficult for people to try to quit smoking. Um, so this is just my, my last data slide here showing a meta-analysis that we did showing that um, uh, basically looking across studies that medication did not have any effects at all um, or, or, um, on, on the rates of smoking. And in fact, it was protective. Uh, and this, this effect tended to be more pronounced 
uh, with, uh, in females when medication use was consistent over time and when, uh, when there were clinical samples examined. So I will, I will just wrap it up there and just say that we need to be uh, aware and cognizant of this risk for smoking. Uh, among those who are already smoking, we should really think about taking multimodal approaches to, appro to promote cessation. And obviously, as always, we need lots of extra work. Thanks. I'd like to start with some key statistics um, with respect to um, substance use in this population um, and some motivating, motivating factors. First, you should know that people who are in treatment for substance use problems often have ADHD. So across studies, we see about a quarter to a third. When it is assessed, it's often found. Um, we also have seen this recently validated in pa patients seeking treatment for cannabis use disorders, which has become increasingly relevant, as we all know, for lots of um, political and societal reasons. We know that ADHD makes it harder to succeed in treatment, and you've seen plenty of reasons throughout the presentations that we've heard today. Um, it's not going to be hard for you to appreciate why that's been the case. So what's the prevalence of substance use among people with uh, uh, adults with ADHD? Uh, we know that they are at increased risk of alcohol. Um, not surprisingly, Scott, Scott talked about the cigarettes. We have a huge range of nicotine delivery systems that have been coming about that are now also starting to find their way into all of our research protocols. I'm sure as the research unfolds, you're going to hear more about that. Um, and we know they're at risk for also other substance use disorders. We've had a number of reviews that have been done to look at the magnitude of the risk. Alcohol has been an interesting outcome because across the studies, there's quite a fair amount of variability. On average, we see about a, a, a two-fold increased risk for developing heavy problems with heavy drinking or alcohol use disorder. And here's a slide that helps you understand from our research in Pittsburgh with the Pittsburgh ADHD Longitudinal Study, why some of this variability across studies may have been the case. We uh, analyzed the data from our, our Pittsburgh ADHD Longitudinal Study, the PALS, and we looked at a number of different variables that we thought might coalesce with alcohol use. And in this case, we looked at heavy drinking, we looked at problems from heavy drinking, so the kind of negative consequences that occur. We looked at persistence of ADHD in these cases, and we also looked at depression. And what was very interesting in this study, and we recently published, is that we had a number of different groups that emerged. Most importantly, look at the green line on the top. Those are people who had the highest levels of alcohol problems throughout their 20s. On the x-axis, you can see age 21 to 29. 88, the individuals who had ADHD histories were more likely to be in that group. Not too surprising. There was a group in the middle, the purple line, that did have elevated alcohol problems, but they also had more depression. Individuals with ADHD were more likely to be in that group also. Notice, though, the depression did not fall in the green bar group. So it doesn't always, it's not always the case that depression is tracking with alcohol problems. Finally, look at the blue line on the bottom. This is what creates the trickiness across the studies when you see sometimes publications showing there's no risk for alcohol. In that group, they had none of the problems. Now, it doesn't mean they weren't impaired on other measures in our study. We have lots and lots of measures. And just think about Russ Barkley's presentation on how many ways people with ADHD can have difficulties. We're only looking at a few things here. In this case, no alcohol problems at all. If you average that all together, you end up maybe saying, ah, ADHD not associated with alcohol problems. It's the heterogeneity that's really critical to pay attention to. Other substance use disorders, about a one and a half times increased risk. The New York Longitudinal Study that Russ referred to being the longest running study out there, um, at a mean age of 41, they found 14% had a substance use disorder versus 5% who didn't have ADHD had a substance use disorder. And the persistence of ADHD mattered. Again, that tends to vary across studies. Don't think that it's only people who have persisting ADHD who are at risk of substance use disorder. It's not. It does track with it, but not 100% of the time. 
Scott mentioned the MTA study. By age 25, we had increased risk for cannabis use disorder and increased use for weekly cannabis use. This is critical as a healthcare provider to pay attention to. People may not tell you or admit to or be comfortable with saying that they're having problems from their use, but don't forget to assess degree of use because that in and of itself can be something to pay attention to clinically. Marijuana has become very interesting. In the MTA study, Scott mentioned um, John Mitchell, who's done some nice studies he, um, with, with the MTA and other data sets. One study that he accomplished with the MTA data was to look at reasons that people shared with us in open-ended interviews about why they use cannabis. And some of them shared the perception that it's therapeutic for them. So we're we really don't have a great sense of exactly what this means. Because, for example, we know that marijuana has adverse effects on working memory. So we also know that people with ADHD, on average, have difficulties with their working memory. Should cannabis be something that is going to help in that domain? Absolutely not. So it, there, um, there are a number of reasons to be concerned about cannabis use in this population, and we have a lot of research that we need to do in order to understand that. So I'll tell you a little bit about why ADHD might contribute to risk for addiction. I actually feel like the people, who, everyone who presented before me gave you plenty of reasons to understand. Uh, for example, obesity, that is, um, is often studied as a form of an addiction. Smoking, you certainly heard about that. I'm gonna show you some slides that are kind of similar and pick up on similar factors. What I wanna point out here is, notice the delinquency in the big orange bar on the bottom. People, investigators used to say, oh, it's just all the kids with the behavior problems. Those are the only ones we need to pay attention to and would control for that and the ADHD prediction would fall out. Well, we now understand that delinquency, yes, it does track with substance use um, almost always, uh, except for nicotine in adolescence, but it doesn't mean that um, we should be ignoring all of the other potential factors that might be driving this association, and that would be an unfortunate consequence. So on the next slide, you'll see, don't be scared. You know, <laughs> you can look at it later if you want to. We have two slides like this that basically, similar to Scott's model, um, my colleague Bill Pelham and I spent a fair amount of time kind of thinking about what are all the reasons that might explain increased, increased risk. On the left side in the blue circles, you see the, 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 a diagram that basically talks about the, the deficits associated with ADHD that drive ADHD impairments. On the far right, you see the red upside down triangle that indicates substance use. Everything else are factors that help us understand why those two things are connected, such as academic difficulties, social difficulties, um, uh, conduct problems, all the impairments. At the very top, you see treatments. At the very bottom, you see parenting. Those are factors that we really do believe moderate the, uh, the flow of these pathways. This is a similar slide. We just didn't have room to put it all in one, and we emphasize in this one negative affect beliefs and coping pathways. We do believe that stress and coping pathways are active, the point, exact point at which those become active is not 100% clear. We were recently funded to follow the, the PALS sample um, into mid-adulthood, and we'll be looking at these kinds of pathways to see if they really become activated, especially in later age. Um, the bottom circle there says differential response to alcohol and other substances. Scott very nicely highlighted this. Um, we do believe there is the potential that this population, for lots of genetic and neurobiological reasons, has a differential response to substances that may increase their vulnerability. That's important, important to know. So beliefs about alcohol's effects. This is a, a variable that is frequently studied in the substance use literature. Um, in, it started with alcohol. Um, and the idea here is that people's beliefs, their cognitions, about the way that a substance affects people will drive to some extent their use. And there's lots of data to show that that is indeed the case. Even very young children, way too young to, you would think, even know what alcohol is, begin to form an understanding of what alcohol is based on what they see in the home. 
And we know that these things change with age and with experience, and they do drive substance use. We often believe that targeting these understandings should affect one's substance use. What we've found, however, that in people with ADHD, that just trying to affect their understanding doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily likely to help because people with ADHD, they know what alcohol does, both the good things and the bad things, but the connections between their beliefs and their behavior is disconnect. It's just not well connected. So what that does is it challenges the idea that education alone is a sufficient intervention. Therefore, multimodal approaches, approaches are most likely to be necessary. So how do we treat? Think now about everything you heard from all the presenters up to me, because it all applies. There are two papers that are super helpful for you to know about. I've cited them on this slide as well, on the next, as, well as on the next slide, and I highly recommend that you get them. They're extremely well written with great clinical applications. They'll give you very specific um, points for knowing what to do. So this first paper, um, I talk about it even though this is a webinar on adults. This first paper um, included some reviews of some studies with adults and the fact that um, recommendations for adolescents is, is not too dissimilar from what we think about for adults as well, um, with the exception of involving families. Um, in this, this review was a, um, a, done by an international panel of 55 experts, and they considered the limited evidence base that exists, unfortunately, on the treatment of adolescents and even adults with substance use disorder and ADHD. They also brought to bear their clinical experience and basically looked at a long list of recommendations and voted on them. And what they came up from this is recommendations that routine screening in both types of patients is recommended. Therefore, consider substance use in your patients with ADHD. Consider ADHD in your patients with substance use. Um, I'd like to all also let, let the professionals know that on the NIDA webpage that they have a quick screen. If you just Google NIDA quick screen, there's a nice screener in there for looking at substance use in patients. Careful consideration of history is critical. So for example, I talked about marijuana use affecting working memory. ADHD also hampers working memory. Well, when did that difficulty with working memory and the associated cognitive problems begin? Careful assessment of the ordering of symptom onset over time is really critical. Um, recommendation in there was made for long acting stimulants for ADHD embedded within psychotherapy. And this, now this is particularly relevant for the adolescents. We know across the studies that treating ADHD alone does not reduce substance use disorder. So the recommendation was from this panel to couch pharmacotherapy, particularly long acting stimulants within the modalities of treatment that you see I have listed there. There was interestingly a lack of consensus on an abstinence requirement before treating. They just could not bring themselves to that point. So this is something that you will need to consider um, if you're a professional treating this comorbidity um, in your individual patients. Uh, this other paper, Carpentier and Levin, um, is one that was uh, conducted to review uh, treatment of the literature on adults specifically. Interestingly, they also tapped into the adolescent literature. It's unfortunately just because it's so slim. Um, and uh, in that uh, review, they pointed to the fact that the data on medication effects in adults with ADHD and substance use disorder, they're just less strong than for adults with ADHD alone. So the implication there is to realize that when treating ADHD in the context of substance use disorder, medication treatment can be helpful, but the, the effects may not be as strong. And there are other factors that are gonna to have to be considered, such as if abstinence is desired in the treatment in order to move forward, um, it may be difficult. And other resources and therapeutic modalities may, be need, may need to be brought to bear to assist with that if that is the desire. Um, motivation to, uh, to accomplish that and come regularly to treatment can be challenge, challenging. Um, assessments of patients can be difficult. As, as I mentioned, we often have many other comorbidities that are involved. 
and um, uh, someone with the expertise to be able to conduct that thorough history may be needed before moving forward with treatment. Um, and I mentioned the other comorbidities. The conclusions from this paper were that long-acting medications are recommended, and then um, some research, recent, re recent research did show, and I think Fran Levin was involved with this, that sometimes higher doses with really close monitoring actually contribute to a better outcome. Um, and also across studies that have that have been done, the good news is substance use has not worsened as a function of using a psychostimulant treatment in this population, and that is often a major concern. And again, multimodality treatment, so motivational enhancement and cognitive behavior therapy, have been indicated um, definitely for substance use, both of, both of those conditions and ADHD. So I'll be ending on this last slide, um, which is a little bit of a, um, a step to the side of the issue that I've been talking about. So many people are concerned about misuse of stimulant medications. Um, and we all know that, that that has proliferated out in the, uh, particularly in college populations and to some extent down into the adolescent age range, although not quite as much. Um, in Pittsburgh, we started to think about this um, issue about seven or eight years ago and started developing some strategies for addressing it. We developed a workshop for primary care providers um, who were treating college students with ADHD. Um, it's a really brief one hour workshop where we developed clinical management strategies for the docs and their, and their practice um, staff to use with their patients. Um, and in that initial open study, we did find reduction in risk, which was, which was promising and helpful to see. And we've now just completed a randomized clinical trial with um, pediatricians and their teenage patients. If you're interested in reading more about that, you can see the citations there. Um, the Journal of Adolescent Health paper actually lists the strategies um, in that paper. And so that might be helpful for you to see if you're interested in preventing stimulant misuse and diversion. So I'm going to take a slightly different tact. I'm not going to give you a lot of content about ADHD itself, but what I am going to go through is how do you set your practice up to be able to manage ADHD across the lifespan, do a really good job of it, uh, and not have it really bog down your practice. This slide set is really meant uh, as a resource, so I would encourage you to, to download it and use it uh, with your colleagues in your practice as you prepare uh, and set up your practice to really do a good job with ADHD patients. So I do have some disclosures. None of them are uh, directly rele relevant to ADHD, uh, but there they are. And what I want to do is really go through the key roles that we have as uh, primary care clinicians, uh, and then particularly, uh, how we prepare our practice. So preparing the practice is really the starting point. And obviously we need to have uh, for recognizing patients really across the lifespan with ADHD. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We need to be able to educate patients and families. So we need resources for that uh, because that needs to go on for a long time as they really become expert in their uh, particular condition. We need to assess patients' goals, comorbidities, impairments, because we really, again, if we aren't in uh, sync with our patients, they're not going to adhere long term. And the goal with ADHD is really lifelong uh, care of this problem. As primary care providers, we really the integration of ADHD care with care of all of the other problems the patient may have and also with preventive care so it doesn't get lost because that itself can be a major uh, problem for patients. Obviously our practices by themselves are not going to be the only uh, source of care for our patients and we need to know how to mobilize family, community, uh, and web and regional resources uh, for our patients as well. And finally, fostering long-term adherence and retention and care is critical for patients to have uh, satisfying lives. So how do we prepare the practice? Uh, I'm gonna go through these uh, each with a, a separate slide, but just as an overview, we need to clarify 
the role that we uh, are going to take as a practice. Uh, do we see our scope of ADHD care in primary care being identifying patients and referring them on to a good resource in our community? Or are we actually going to provide them? So think about they come to our website, they get an appointment, they come in for visits, uh, we see them, things happen before and after we see them, they go home, do we have a reminder system, do we help them get prescriptions and so forth. Another critical role that we have in primary care is with our community. So what's going to be our relationships and agreements with area schools? This is critical to get worked out at the practice level rather than for each patient individually. And I've already mentioned the community regional and national resources. Finally, and this is critical to the long-term maintenance of, uh, of these patients in care, is having a patient registry. This may be uh, something built already into the EMR that you're using, uh, but how do we uh, maintain a registry of patients in our practice with ADHD? And then what's our strategy is gonna be to use it to make sure that our patients stay in uh, active care? So I mentioned guidelines. Uh, I particularly like the Canadian guideline because uh, Canada's on our family medicine uh, sort of basic primary care system and so they just naturally think across the lifespan. So here, uh, just as an example of the resources uh, available uh, already packaged in their guidelines. So it's, it's both web and, and uh, um, downloadable uh, format. Uh, I find this a very helpful approach. So here's just an example uh, of what's in the Canadian uh, guideline. Uh, and it really steps you through uh, yeah, what you need to do, the steps you need to do, the, the approach you need to think through. And I find this very helpful in working with staff so they know how to respond efficiently to ADHD patients as they're coming in, as they're presenting, as we're making the diagnosis, uh, or as the patients living with ADHD come back over, oh, um, you know, over the long term for uh, crises, for medication adjustments, uh, and so forth. Now, we need to recognize uh, ADHD. Uh, there's not a recommendation to screen every patient in primary care settings for ADHD. So we don't do this universally. But there's also a right realization that if a patient has any risk factors for ADHD, then we ought to take a case finding approach uh, and have a practice approach to efficiently recognizing those patients early and moving them into effective care. So here are, are a list of the um, <clears throat> uh, high risk you know, flags, if you would be, the red flags that if a patient comes in demonstrating these over time, uh, I or somebody in my practice needs to think about, does this patient possibly have ADHD? And if so, uh, the, for adults, the uh, uh, adult uh, self-report scale uh, is very useful. And while it looks like a long scale, it's in fact just those first uh, six questions that are used uh, for screening. And that's as effective from a, from a uh, case finding perspective as using the entire instrument. Going on to part B does give you a lot of extra information for then uh, working with the patient, but part A is all you need, just those six questions uh, as a screening base to give you a really good um, uh, tool for recognizing ADHD in the practice. Now there's another group of uh, uh, you know, patients that we need to look uh, carefully at, and that's really the first line, that ADHD in the family. Because we know that if there's one patient in the family with ADHD, there's quite likely going to be additional. It's estimated overall at 76%. Uh, but we know a lot about this. We know the genes that uh, uh, convey risk. We know the uh, neurotransmitters that they produce that convey the risk. We know how they affect the development of the brain and the white uh, long neuron pathways uh, that affect communication in the brain. We know how they affect brain networks, uh, which is really how the brain functions with us. So we now understand a lot about how, uh, uh, you know, how ADHD is passed down in families, but we have to recognize them uh, and we have to recognize that family risk uh, 
to identify extra patients. So if I've got a child with ADHD, I may well have an adult with ADHD that's not recognized yet and vice versa. So uh, do think about it as a key screening uh, approach. Now, I talked about implementing the supports in your practice. Uh, as think about it, you know, do a flow chart of how your patients typically move through the practice and then think about what can be more efficient for our, myself as a clinician, for my team, you know, and for the patient. So think about what do you want up on your portal? Uh, what, uh, what educational resources, if a patient or family thinks, gee, I wonder if Johnny has ADHD, is there an educational resource they can go to on, on your practice portal that will help uh, identify uh, screening tools? Some patients uh, uh, will use a screening tool uh, self-motivated. And, you know, think about, uh, you know, sort of these as the, the tools to set up, but also think about how do you get your practice staff together as a team? And clearly, you have to understand the individual roles that people are going to uh, play and that they expect of each other to play. So who's the care manager? Uh, is each clinician the care manager for their own patients? Or is there a nurse in the practice or a social worker in the practice that takes on uh, the role of care manager? And what does that mean? Does it mean that they track? Does it mean they get in touch periodically? Does it mean they surveil and make sure that they're staying on medications and so forth? Who administers the tool? Uh, yeah, and if we're dealing with schools, who, who prompts the school to send in a Vanderbilt or another uh, instrument? Think about uh, uh, prescription refills. Who's going to routinely manage those Schedule II refills um, as, they, uh, as they come in from chronic adhering patients? So think about all these uh, points in terms of how does your practice work effectively as a team to manage ADHD uh, across the practice, across the lifespan in a way that's satisfying for themselves because they know what they're doing and they know they're doing a good job for their patients and families because they're getting high quality service uh, and for you as the, uh, you know, as, the, as the key clinician. We need to think about our patients because long term, if the patient isn't a key team member in managing their own condition, they're not going to stay in chronic care really of almost any condition. So we know in primary care that shared decision making using motivational interviewing techniques uh, and so forth can be very helpful. Identify what the patient's goals are. What are their key goals in life uh, in terms of things they want to accomplish uh, as, uh, as individuals, as well as what is their goal in terms of ADHD care. So it's your mindful of that, and you can use that in shared decision-making and motivational interviewing as you give them the best tools to get uh, where they want to go in life. Schools are critical, and this can also be college. So for adults, this may be college or maybe uh, retraining programs. Uh, but who is the key contact in your practice for the school? Who, who knows the key resource in the four elementary schools, two high schools, and the community colleges in your uh, neighborhood that your patients are going to? Uh, and do you have a key contact so that uh, anyone in that school can call up and not have to figure out who do I need to talk to about this person uh, who's in our school, but we're worried about. So think about uh, that and think about the communication with them. Again, this makes uh, the job uh, of high quality care very effective. Also think about what is going to be our role uh, overall all as a team with school. Are we going to provide information for IEP development? Are we going to actually go and attend? Or is our uh, community social worker going to attend uh, IEP meetings? Uh, think through all of that and communicate and work it out with the school. Talked about uh, resources. Here are obviously a number of them that you're going to want. You're going to want a specialist in uh, learning disorders when you have a patient with that. But you're also going to want uh, uh, you know, uh, people in other uh, professionals, substance abuse, we've already talked about, and, and so forth, uh, that can be the go-to people that you know, they understand ADHD, 
and will work with you with patients that have uh, uh, that are living with ADHD as well. So think about who are these key re resources and does my team know them so that they can use them as well. Registry, I've already talked about, you just need to have somebody responsible, you need to work it out so that you can uh, surveil your ADHD practice uh, population and make sure they stay in care and uh, are also keeping up with other preventive maintenance uh, activities and so forth. Need to integrate this with other care. So not uncommonly for our patients to have uh, in, in adult years, uh, other conditions, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and so forth. You do wanna think about how do we organize it so that it works for them and they can be effective in staying on treatment for all of the things uh, that uh, we want them uh, you know, taken care of, not just the ADHD. Use long-acting preparations, use long-acting uh, contraceptive, for instance, uh, can be very helpful. And also think through families where you've got multiple members. How do they work well uh, to support each other uh, with their ADHD? So uh, these are all tasks to think through as you set up your practice. We need to also have strategies for as patients, you know, age up through various life transitions uh, in terms of taking on new responsibilities. When do they shift in terms of who's taking primary responsibility for medication, for refills, and, and so forth. And your team has to have a strategy. This often can be, you know, your team can be very helpful in terms of counseling patients as they hit these uh, uh, milestones in life and move through them both as individuals and as families. Now, I'm going to bookend uh, our overall talk. Uh, we started with discussion about that included, you know, that ADHD has uh, a lot of risk for patients, but there's a hopeful message there as well. So this is looking at psychiatric comorbidities, and it's part of the reason we want to integrate the care so that we are effectively managing uh, all of the patient's comorbidities as well as the ADHD. But look at the next two slides. These are from uh, Sweden and they use national data that's at the individual level. So treated women uh, and, uh, and these, these are looking at the same women or the same men when they're on treatment and when their treatment lapses. And so you can see here across the uh, board that patients who stay, you know, who are on their meds compared to the same uh, individuals when they're not on their meds are much less likely uh, to be engaged in crime. Uh, SSRI is interesting. You'll see the, the risk doesn't change there. It's not just that they're in care and we're prescribing the medication, might be taking care of the actual ADHD uh, treatment. Uh, that is uh, is key in reducing their risk of uh, of criminality. Here's looking at serious uh, transportation accidents, motor vehicle accidents, car wrecks, uh, and again, this is within individual effects. So this is comparing the number of accidents or the number of yeah accidents that they are in, uh, involved in during months of their life when they are taking. ADHD medication that from, uh, from prescriber data uh, that's also part of the Swedish registry compared to months when we know they are not taking their ADHD medication because they don't have it. Yeah, and you can see the marked decrease in, uh, in accidents. And uh, particularly if you look at the bottom line, motorcycle riders, if you're a motorcycle rider, don't go out on your motorcycle unless you've taken your ADHD medication because uh, there's a 90% reduction uh, with medications and the high rate of accidents in that group. So, so what we do is be very helpful to our patients and can not only uh, help them have a more satisfying life, but actually have them uh, have more life. And I think that is absolutely uh, critical is what makes it such a rewarding, uh, um, you know, professional experience 
to be able to manage ADHD with uh, a real high quality over long periods of time for your patients and their families. So, but really think, take a step back, organize your practice, uh, uh, work with your practice team members to have a system of care uh, that is satisfying for you professionally, but is really rewarding in terms of the improvement in uh, the lives of your patients. The question is a uh, concern about sugars, corn, corn syrup, sugar, and other such sugars, fructose, and if they have a relationship with ADHD, with um, appetite and so forth. Um, I think you've said that people with ADHD tend to look for higher calorie, sweeter foods. What is that relationship? Yeah, so it's one of those myths that um, sugar causes hyperactivity or ADHD um, symptoms, and that's actually not the case. It's just that um, activities in which there's a lot of sugar, like birthday parties with cakes and cupcakes, that you're just going to have a lot of you know hyperactive kids in, in that way. Um, the direction is more that people with ADHD are very are very attracted to sugar um, and get a lot of reward from it um, in that way. So it's almost like the threshold of sweetness you'll often find is a lot higher for people with ADHD when they have something that other people might think is sickeningly sweet um, that people with ADHD will report to as being like moderately sweet. Um, in terms of if the question was around preservatives and, and all of those, you know, that is put in foods, I mean, certainly um, that isn't nutritious and that it does, it at least temporarily fills people up. And even a lot of nutritionists and dietitians will say that, you know, part of the problem with obesity is not just what people are eating, but it's actually what they're not eating. And so if we're eating a high sugar diet, we're taking our calories in there, we're feeling, you know, satiated maybe after having a lot of calories, but it means we're not eating perhaps the proteins, the fruits and the vegetables and, and those foods. So it's not just what people are eating we have to be aware of, but looking at the overall diet of what they're also not taking in because they might be relying on, you know, really nutritionally empty calories and sugar and sugar products. Um, our next question is for Dr. Culpepper, and uh, it is a question that a parent has regarding her young adult. And this young adult, again, is now managing her own ADHD, but is not making the appointments, not following up. The adult is over the age of 21. What can parents be doing to help their young adults with their treatment, maintain their, their treatment? And either Dr. Dr. Culpepper or Dr. Livierda, I know you both work with young adults. What can a parent do? Sure, and I, you know, I think uh, you know, this is, is often a very difficult transition. Uh, because if we as uh, um, providers put the parent in control mode or in, in the you need to take care of this sort of mode, uh, which I don't think most of us do, it really sets them up for, you know, for failure. Uh, I think what we really need to do is encourage uh, the mother in this case to really be a good uh, coach and support person for her daughter. Uh, and recognize that her main role is as her mother, not as her ADHD uh, caregiver. Uh, and so it, it's painful sometimes to watch, uh, both as a, a professional and as a, a parent. But at times, uh, patients really have to, uh, you know, spend a, a year or two or three recognizing that they have to take ownership of their own problem. Uh, and I think there are a number of things you can do uh, during that time. One is not constantly focus on the ADHD. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the daughter you know, is a whole person. So celebrate her successes, celebrate uh, uh, her, uh, you know, the, her capacities and, and where she is positive. Uh, and, uh, and basically uh, become a, uh, a coach to her, if you would, in terms of helping her problem solve. Uh, not accepting your solution, uh, but coming to her own 
uh, strategies her own, and her own solution uh, to the problem she's encountering. Uh, it's reasonable to not constantly, but at tactical points, uh, uh, be able to point out that, you know, ADHD and inadequate care of ADHD may be contributing to this. Uh, and uh, it's something you might ought to think about making sure uh, you're, uh, you're, you're getting, uh, you know, the best care for her. Uh, maybe helping her identify strategies uh, or people in the, in, in the community that can be resources to her. Uh, but, but the key, I think, in this situation is for the mother to be mother uh, before uh, she tries to be ADHD provider. Is there any research with uh, any nicotine research and any association to uh, cannabinoid uptake, cannabis uptake, and other uh, self-medication with THC, CBD, and a reduction or an alleviation of ADHD symptoms? Uh, there's, there, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Um, let me see if I can unpack that a little bit. I, I mean, in in general, I think that most of the relationships that the question alluded to have not been supported empirically. I mean, certainly people, you know, people who have ADHD are more likely to use cannabis. Oh, um, people who, um, and, and we know that people who use cannabis are also likely to also use nicotine and, and tobacco products. Um, but in terms of the, the sort of the pharmacology of that within ADHD, I don't think we've investigated that very much. You're Research on estimated life expectancy. Was there any correlation with treatment that included medication management versus treatment or non-treatment without medication management? Did you see a change, either positive or negative, for life expectancy? Yeah, great, great question. And unfortunately, having only 15 minutes didn't allow me to go into all of the uh, nuances about methodology and and uh, and our what we had done. You can see our paper at the journal of uh, attention disorders. Uh, also, I summarize it in the ADHD report, uh, my newsletter. But uh, long story short is, as all longitudinal studies have found, treatment during childhood and even early adolescence has no detectable benefits when kids are followed up into young adulthood or adulthood. And the, largely the reason for that is that the vast majority of our uh, children are not in treatment after they leave high school. Indeed, even during high school, uh, even the MTA study, which had kids on medication, found that only about 25 to 28 percent of them were being treated in high school with meds, even less so with regard to other psychological therapies. Uh, and by the time they were 21 years of age, in my study, it was below uh, 10 to 15 percent and then below 10 percent by age 27. So you're, you're looking here at largely childhood and early adolescent treated cases who, as they get older, individuate from their families, want to say in what's happening to them and then leave home, uh, are not participating in treatment. And al although that doesn't sound <clears throat> like it, it makes any sense. It does make sense. These people never called you. Their parents called you. Their teachers called you. They don't see themselves as having a disorder yet. They uh, are not so motivated. If you look at Prochaska's readiness for change model, they're not ready to change. In, in fact, they can't wait to get you off their back and get out on their own uh, and, and get away from treatment. So every longitudinal study I have looked at that involved treatment shows this to be the long-term course. So the answer is no. Treatment uh, in our study, as in others, uh, had no effect, not only on all the other outcomes we looked at in that study, but had no effect on altering uh, life course uh, and uh, estimated life expectancy. So. Uh, and, and that's not something, despite the sobering nature of it, to get too discouraged about because you would find the same thing in diabetes, high blood pressure, epilepsy, any chronic medical condition in which people opt out of treatment very young, uh, you're not going to see any effect of early treatment on life course 10 years later. Uh, and that makes perfect sense. They, they've gone back to baseline again. They've reverted to their previous behaviors uh, 
despite some maturation there. <clears throat> and we don't see that either. So that doesn't mean the treatment doesn't work, as Dr. Culpepper pointed out, and I could give you many other studies on top of those that shows uh, that virtually every major domain of life activity that we look at, from auto accidents to teen pregnancy to uh, job problems to risk of being fired from a job and, and so on, uh, and substance use, all of them show that when treatment is engaged, uh, there is a reduction in harm to the individual compared to uh, even the months that the individual isn't on treatment. So even these within subject comparisons that he mentioned uh, show this to be the case. So, um, you know, that, that's really convincing data because it helps to take into account other confounding factors in, in other randomized trials. So um, I think the treatment definitely would make a difference, but it didn't in our study or in other studies because the kids didn't own the disorder, didn't continue with it. So two things. One, Adam Levine and other people on YouTube have great videos on owning your disorder. Uh, number two, look at Prochaska's readiness to change model. If necessary, uh, I reviewed this in my book, When an Adult You Love Has ADHD, to try to help convince caregivers and others around them of what you do based on where the person is in readiness to change. Uh, and if they're in denial, if they're at the pre-contemplation stage, that, that's a very different thing that you will do to help them than it would be if they're at the contemplation stage where you might have a list of providers and other things. But uh, long story short, uh, treatment in childhood makes no difference to adult outcome. We see this often at transition age, but we see this all through adulthood. A person is going through uh, uh, their primary care provider or their a uh, specialist for ADHD enters retirement, is no longer available, they are looking for a new provider, and at that point there is a disruption in their treatment. And now in many cases the, the use of stimulant medication has been conflated with opioid use, and so there are doctors who are afraid of prescribing, or reluctant, I should not say afraid, for, please forgive me, they are reluctant. How can a person manage this difficulty staying on treatment when they can't find someone who can further the treatment that they have had? First of all, the CHAD website has a professional identifier or locator service uh, in Canada. Also, CADRA, C-A-D-D-R-A dot C-A, can be helpful in identifying area resources. Uh, also, medicinenow dot uh, net, I believe it is, is another locator service where you enter the condition you're interested in and they will bring up people who have listed themselves as being specialists within that area. So those are several good starting points. Absent those, of course, contact the local medical center, uh, either psychiatry or behavioral pediatrics or behavioral neurology or family practice, uh, to ask them where do they identify the most expert individuals in the community as a resource? Uh, and, and that's another avenue for it. Uh, thirdly, you can try to find if there's a local CHAD chapter near you, that's also on CHAD's website, uh, and contact their current president. Uh, that group is going to have field tested your region for various professionals, who's good, who isn't, who to go, who to stay away from. So if you can find those people, there's no better resource than families who have pioneered the area already on, on, almost on your behalf. So see if you can contact them uh, as well. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, although this isn't always very successful, uh, look at the uh, state medical directories for psychiatry, psychology, and these other specialties, oftentimes the state association will list their members by specialty. Uh, and that might be another way of exposing some of these experts that are all relatively well hidden to the rest of us because they don't publish research and they're, they're not nationally visible, but that doesn't mean they're not good uh, and, and useful to you. So that would be my suggestion. Larry, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, the only point I would make is sometimes it's uh, easier for patients to find uh, the specialist uh, involved in ADHD care in their community uh, than it is uh, a primary care base for that. 
And so that may be where you start uh, as a patient, is if you can find at the local uh, medical center or I should say uh, a lot of times psychiatrists or uh, uh, you know, psychologists uh, you know, will be known as the person to go to for, uh, for ADHD yeah. care. Uh, they can then guide you in terms of, you know, ask them as well, right. you know, who's a good primary care to go to, uh, to that, uh, that accepts adult ADHD and that you found works effectively with you and, and with, uh, you know, patients with ADHD as a way to sort of back into having a primary care uh, provider that's, uh, 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 that's going to be effective as well. One of the uh, just a brief thing I'll just add. Uh, this is Brooke Molina. Is we we've we've often found it helpful that um, when there are pro providers who are willing to care, but they're just a little bit sheepish about it. That if 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 the patients do a good job of keeping their records, you know, as their historical records, that can be helpful to document the history of diagnosis and treatment. Um, and the other thing is you know, willingness to consider the multimodality approach to dealing with the ADHD. So a patient who comes in, who's willing to engage in therapy, who's willing to do some homework, recognizing the difficulties of doing that with ADHD admittedly, but isn't just coming in saying, I need a prescription. If, you're, if the patient's willing to embrace those kinds of ways of dealing with the difficulties, then that just helps in, in, in our experience, kind of the, the, the provider who's a little bit nervous about taking on a new patient. Yeah, I mean, one, one uh, thing there is before your uh, uh, retiring uh, provider uh, you know, has actually closed his practice, uh, ask him or her uh, for a copy of your record. Because uh, in most states, legally, uh, patients are entitled uh, you know, to do that. Uh, so that you've got your record or a, a you know, good summary of it to then have in your pocket, to, if you would, to take to the new provider. Uh, it's often so much easier uh, than trying to retrieve a record after a retired physician has uh, extra retired and uh, the records are now with the medical record room at this hospital or, yeah, it, it just becomes a, a labyrinth to try to get through to actually get the record. So uh, do grab it before the, uh, you know, or copy of it before the, the physician has actually shut the door. The question is, do you see other eating disorders such as orthorexia in addition to anorexia, um, binge eating disorder, do you see orthorexia used as a method to control emotions, emotional behavior con to control symptoms for ADHD? Yes, yeah, so the, the eating disorders that I see the most with ADHD are bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder. However, I have treated, um, as I mentioned, I work with boys and men. I've treated men uh, with ADHD who have anorexia nervosa. And for those of you who might not know what orthorexia is, it's not an um, actual diagnosis, but it's a, an eating disorder characterized by people who want to who are obsessed with eating clean and eating pure, often organic. They tend to be vegan, but it tends to be almost, we think of it as like on the obsessive compulsive spectrum. Um, and yes, I have seen that. And, you know, speaking with, with, as far as the last question with stimulants, I find that, you know, my role as a clinician in working sometimes with um, physicians who are prescribing is sometimes advocating on behalf of my patients in terms of stimulant treatment. Now, if you take something like in the eating disorder community before Vyvanse was approved for binge eating disorder, it was seen as very contraindicated to prescribe a stimulant medication to someone with an eating disorder, um, and especially with anorexia nervosa. And so I've had to work, you know, with with um, prescribers in with this particular patient I was working with who had anorexia, and he said the anorexia was a way of almost kind of it, it. There was some body image component, but also he said it just calmed him from all of the sort of noise that he felt in his head, um, all the racing thoughts around the ADHD, and and that it served that kind of function. And he was prescribed a low dose of a stimulant, and it helped tremendously. It was obviously very, very closely monitored, but that's where I feel, you know, our work is as clinicians in terms of advocating for our patients, 
in getting that kind of you know treatment. But yes, I've seen the range, but I would say the majority is going to be typically bulimia and binge eating disorder. You know, that said, uh, thanks, Roberto. Um, there have been several studies, particularly the DeMontis uh, large genome-wide study involving tens of thousands of ADHD and control cases that showed that there's actually a negative relationship between ADHD and anorexia, uh, whereas it's a positive one between ADHD and uh, binge eating uh, pathology. Uh, and, and so people with ADHD are actually less likely to get anorexia than as anybody in the general population. But as Roberto pointed out, that doesn't mean you won't see it. It just means that the odds are quite low that those two go together. So understand that eating pathology across the spectrum from anorexia to binge eating and so on uh, is not all equally likely within an ADHD adolescent or adult population. It's really the impulse eating pathologies, as Roberto nicely pointed out, is uh, that, that is the most common and that you're going to really struggle to deal with uh, in trying to get some handle on that eating problem, uh, again, particularly if they're not being medically managed for their ADHD. Right. Well, typically with anorexia, it's obsessive compulsive disorder that we would see as the most common comorbid condition with anorexia than we would see with ADHD. Indeed. Can the association of fewer problems while employing medications prior to treatment just be a function of those who are doing better anyway, uh, being more conscientious about their treatment plans? In other words, both treatment participation and fewer accidents are, result, are resulting from better adjustment to treatment? Uh, the, the Swedish data that I was showing in terms of reduced criminality and reduced uh, uh, accidents, that is using the patient him or herself uh, as a comparison. So we take uh, 100 individuals and in Sweden, I mean, the, this is based on Swedish registry data. They have their entire population. So it's not a select group of people. It's, it's the entire uh, you know, adult population. We look at those that have a diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, we look at their pharmacy records, and we know, okay, for these three months, uh, they were picking up their prescriptions regularly, uh, and, they, and they did that, uh, you know, for this year and a half, but then there's a six-month interval where they did not get refills, and so we're using the uh, prescription uh, filling data really to identify patients when they're on treatment and when they're off treatment, and if we look uh, they, uh, how many accidents did this individual have while they were on treatment? Uh, and they have, uh, you know, two accidents a year, say, when they're on treatment. And then we look at the same patient, uh, uh, the months when they weren't on treatment, and we see that uh, during the months they're not on treatment, uh, they have uh, a much higher rate of accidents. They have um, then accidents for you. Uh, that's the comparison. So uh, it's really looking at patients when they're on treatment, reasons why they're on and off treatment, we don't know. So it may be that they're functioning better in other domains of their life, uh, and that's uh, affecting when they take treatment. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not like we're self-selecting a group of patients to say uh, that they're doing better than this other group. It's the same patients being compared uh, to themselves. That's what makes those studies so compelling, is using the patient as their own control. But even in the studies that were not able to do that, they do statistically and using randomization as well, uh, are able to try to control for the pre-existing characteristics of the individual as the possible predictor of the outcome rather than the treatment. And, and besides Larry's comments, this has been shown not just for car crashes uh, and not just for uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, criminality, but also for uh, teen pregnancy, uh, to some extent for drug use, uh, also for employability and uh, the likelihood that the individual gets fired from a job. Uh, and more recently, uh, even overall mortality is drastically altered, as is risk for accidents of all kinds, 
uh, in patients when they're on medication, when they're off medication. So again, these within patient comparisons using large population-wide databases are very compelling about the effectiveness of ongoing treatment at reducing risk for all of these health and wellness uh, variables, um, um, among others. So uh, I, again, I find that all the more reason why we need to be treating these individuals uh, early and often uh, and convincing them to stay with their treatment plan, even if they feel they don't need it anymore or they don't like the side effects or they can't afford the medication, finding ways to get around these obstacles to keeping them adhering to treatment become increasingly important because you literally uh, can save their life uh, by helping them with treatment, as Larry has pointed out. And there's very few other areas in psychiatry anyway where we have that degree of success with our interventions whether it's anxiety, depression, or bipolar disorder, uh, as we have in the management of, of ADHD. Dr. Solancho, thank you for, uh, thank you and to the Public Policy Committee for organizing this. This has been very informative, very helpful. And thank you to the present, uh, to the audience for their attention and participation. Mm -hmm.